All right, grab your Bibles. We've got uh, just uh, a little bit of time. I'll try to make this. Well, I have to make it fast. So go uh, to Matthew 14. Matthew 14. Um, we're going to read a, uh, a real, real, real familiar story. Do you know why stories in the Bible become really familiar? It's because they're really good. Like David and Goliath. Even Wall Street will mention David and Goliath because it's just a great story. You're just tough to beat David and Goliath. And we have, sometimes we're going to do just a series on just Sunday school stories, you know, the stories that we were raised with. Uh, but today I want to read a story, and I want to talk to you about hearing from God. Um, there's, I'm going to describe this as two sides of the same coin, all right? I'll present the first part to you real quickly, and then I'll go on to what I want to talk about in the message. If you were to take everybody in this room, and you would look at us according to our gifts, our heritage, our family background, our years of experience, our years of inexperience, uh, the breakthroughs, the anointings, the things we've seen God do, the things we've not seen Him do, whatever. Take our entire life, everything about us, and you just start whittling away until you ended up with one ingredient. It would be this. You called upon the name of the Lord, and he heard you. He stripped everything away. It's the one thing everybody in this room who was born again, one thing everyone has in common, is you called upon the name. I called upon the name of the Lord, and he heard me. The flip side of that coin is you were actually designed. Everything about you is designed to hear and to recognize the voice of God. There's this deception that comes uh, into the hearts and minds of God's people that it's so hard to hear his voice. That's not true at all. It's It's so easy to hear his voice because he makes himself hearable. The problem is, how many of you have, uh, you've, you've gone into prayer, you've needed an answer, and so you pray really hard and you listen really hard and nothing happens? How many of you have done that one besides me? All right. So we pray real hard, and then you're driving down the road, you're not thinking about anything, and he speaks to you. How many of you have that happen? Most of us hear better when we're not thinking about it. Why? Because when you work hard to hear the voice of the Lord, you are actually trying to get your natural man to perceive the things of the Spirit of God, which is biblically impossible. What we are trying to do is heighten the awareness of all the natural capacities that we have to hear God's voice when it's the Spirit man that receives the things of the Spirit of God. There's a word that talks about, uh, I, I, I can't, I don't have the, uh, the, the adequate material in front of me to, to, to read this to you, but there's a, a tremendous word study on the word helpmate. When the Lord made a helpmate for Adam, it's, it's a word that actually describes a woman that is fully equipped to stand up face to face to the man. It's not just this little supporter on the side. It is an equal that is able to stand face to face, fully equipped. Now think about this. When Paul talks about husbands and wives, he said, I'm not really talking about husbands and wives. What I'm sharing has to apply there, but what I'm really talking about is the bride of Christ and the Lord. Here's the deal. The Holy Spirit lives inside of you. And we'll read some scripture for this in a moment. But the Holy Spirit speaks to your spirit. Your spirit is designed to stand face to face with the Spirit of God, not as an equal. I mean, he's, he's eternal. He's God. But we are made in his image, and he's, he's given us the capacity to stand face-to-face in that kind of relationship. That is the design of your life in Christ. When you were born again, it was put into your DNA that you would have a natural capacity to hear God. So say this with me. When I was born again, God gave me the ability to hear his voice. It's in my nature. It doesn't come through striving. It comes from rest. That's why we hear him when we're just driving down the road or, you know, turning on the TV or whatever. There'll be that impression. And one of the things that is awkward for us is, is that we, we tend to think, you know, I can't speak for everyone, but, but in, in, in the folks that I've worked with through the years, we tend to think, that when he speaks, it's an outside voice that will be alarming when it comes. 
right? Outside, whoa, what was that? Believe me, he can alarm you. He, he, he can turn you to dust with his voice if he wants to. So it, it's not that there's not that capacity. But the point is, is we often expect the voice of the Lord to come from the outside and alarm us almost as an intruder. The voice of the Lord comes as a friend. It's a familiar voice and often comes as an internal desire. Something gets activated when he speaks. I wouldn't all at all want to suggest that every idea that you get on the in, in, your, in your heart is from the Lord. I'm, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying his voice is familiar. And because it's familiar, it gets discounted. You can generally tell when God's speaking to you. It's when you have an idea that's better than one you could think up yourself. <laughs> he speaks things that oftentimes seem too good to be true. In fact, if it's too good to be true, it probably is. Let's take a quick look at this story in uh, Walking on the Water. And then we'll go to 1 Corinthians 2 and we'll see if we can expedite matters. All right, verse, let's just jump down to 24 to make, save some time. Verse 24 of Matthew 14. Uh, the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now, in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled. I love that. They were troubled. They were scared spitless is what they were. They were troubled saying, it is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Now this fascinates me. This, this makes no sense whatsoever. You're in a boat, you're scared already because of the wind conditions, and you look out on the water, and you think, and everybody around you, we've taken a vote, that's a ghost. Now to make matters worse, the ghost starts talking. And the ghost says, it's me, don't be afraid. Peter decides to talk back. And he says, if it is you, which means he doesn't know if it's you. I don't know if it's Jesus, but if it's you, bid me to come. Now, here's what doesn't make sense to me. If it's a ghost, a talking ghost, that's walking on the water, and it can hold conversation with you, it can say, come, just like Jesus can say, come. Are you with me? Come, sucker, as he, as he, as he sinks, you know. It, it's like... Whatever it is that's out there, Peter doesn't know what it is. Whatever it is, it can say, come, just like it can say, don't be afraid, it's me. Are you with me on that? All right. So what's the difference? Every voice that you know comes from the outside, except for his voice, is the only one that can pierce the heart. So when Peter said, bid me to come, he was waiting for the word that would touch the heart. First Corinthians two. <clears throat> I don't hear pages turning. Is it the iPhone and iPad Bible again? Some of you smart people, would you develop the right app for me that sounds like turning pages for the iPhone? <laughs> All right. First Corinthians two. Oh, some of you are rattling your pages now. Thank you so much. I, I need the encouragement. 1 Corinthians 2, we'll start with verse 9. It actually starts all the way in verse 1. It's a, such a brilliant theme, but, but time doesn't permit uh, that much study on it. Verse 9, but as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. What an amazing promise. What a great statement. Tragically, this verse is often read at funerals because the church by and large feels that anything that is that good must be for eternity and not for now. Look at it again. I has not seen nor ear heard nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. 
Verse 10. But God has revealed them. What is them? Them is the things. The things that are beyond anything we have the intelligence to pray for or expect. God has revealed them to us through his spirit. For the spirit searches all things. Yes, the deep things of God. I use the internet a lot to search for things. And uh, Google has been a great search engine. But the ultimate search engine in the universe is the Holy Spirit. He searches the mind of the Father, which is the greatest resource of information in existence. The Father has been thinking about you as an individual through eternity past. Billions of years on into eternity, he's had you in mind. He's waited for this moment. You don't disappoint him. His plans for you are all for your welfare, not your calamity. He, his, heart, his heart is filled with ab abundant, extravagant thoughts that fit verse 9. I has not seen. You've never seen it before in your life. You've never even heard about it before in your life. It's never even entered your heart before the things that God has prepared for you. So he gave you the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is given to us for a number of reasons. We know the Spirit of God is given to comfort us. We know he's there to guide us, to teach us. We know he's there to empower us. Look through the list sometime. This is on the list and it gets forgotten. He is there to reveal the things that have been given to you by the Father. He's there to find those things. Jesus uh, made reference of this concept in John 16. And he said, he said, I have so many things to tell you, but you can't bear them now. You don't have the weight-carrying capacity for the reality that would be released over you if I told you all that was on my heart. So God works on the inside of us to build in us a strength so that we can carry the weightiness of what he creates when he speaks. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. It doesn't say faith comes from hearing the word. Faith comes from hearing. If faith came from hearing the word, we should just put the word, the scripture on all day long in our cars, in our houses. By the end of the day, we would surpass Wigglesworth, you know. It's, it's not from hearing the word. Just hold on with me. Faith comes from hearing. The capacity for hearing comes from the word. Your interaction to this book is to awaken the God-given capacity for hearing. So when he speaks, when you were born again, he spoke to you. And when he spoke to you, faith was created. When you said yes, you responded out of the gift he gave you to respond with. So he creates realms. So Jesus said, I have so many things to tell you. You can't bear under the weightiness of what I would release over you if I told you all that was in my heart. So he said, I'm sending the Holy Spirit. And everything that exists is mine. The Father gave it to me. Which is a... Are you guys alive? Everybody <laughs> tracking with me? All right. I'm trying to make something fast. I may butcher it in the process, but I'll at least have some. <clears throat> he says... Everything is mine. This is amazing. Jesus gave up everything to become a man and then re-inherited everything as a man. He gave it all, became a man, and then he re-inherited everything. So here he's standing. He says, everything the Father has is mine. And he said, the Holy Spirit's going to take what is mine and declare it to you. Picture this being the bank vault of heaven in which everything exists. Every reality, everything. And he says, the Holy Spirit will take what is mine and he will declare it to you. In other words, every time the Holy Spirit speaks to you, he transfers resource from Jesus' account to yours. Every word comes with the reality of his world being released into your life, into my life. So now he's, Paul's, Paul catches this theme and he says, all right, the Holy Spirit's given to you because this never entered your mind. You don't have the capacity to come up with this stuff on your own. So the Holy Spirit is given to you because he will take the deep things of God, he will take them and he will speak them to you. Boy, talk about a renewed mind to start seeing and perceiving things that are humanly out of reach. Things you wouldn't normally come up with. 
religion is satisfied with human logic. Religion is satisfied with positive, happy thoughts. The kingdom is based on a world we cannot see, but is superior to everything we can see. So, all right, just keep going. I'm almost through. Um, Verse 11, what man knows the things of man except the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. Now, we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God. Why? That we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. The Holy Spirit has been given to you to perceive the unseen realm that has been given to you as an inheritance. Do you see back verse 9, the verse that is used a lot for funerals? Verse 10 says, but God has revealed them to us. In other words, it is a present tense ongoing discovery. It is not reserved for heaven. It is unfolding now. <clears throat> I have, People often say, I, I just can't hear God's voice. And, and I, I understand that struggle. Or God's not speaking to me. He really has nothing to say. It's, he's the word of God. It's hard for him to not have something to say. I equate, in, in my personal walk with the Lord, I equate the presence of the Lord and the voice of the Lord as the same. They are just different ways that he manifests. But because he is the word, his voice and his presence come the same. Now, <clears throat> This passage says, we've not received the spirit of the world, but we've received the spirit who is from God. There's a reason that we might know what's been given to us by God. Why was the Holy Spirit given to you? That you might know the things given to you by God. Why would you need to know them? You don't need to know them unless they're for now. Why would God give you everything? Why would he give you? Why would Jesus say, everything the Father has is mine, and now I'm going to give it to you? And the Holy Spirit is going to take what's mine, and he's going to declare, he's going to take what is mine, he'll put it in word form, because word creates, and he's going to declare it to you. Why would he give you everything? I'm glad you asked. (laughs) Because of the size of the assignment. If the assignment is just to hold on and stay in faith till Jesus returns, we don't need everything. I'll try this side. (laughs) If my assignment is just to hold on to the end, be one of those that endures to the end, then really that everything is really of not much use to me. Unless I see the weightiness of the Great Commission to disciple nations. He gives everything and he's not a God of waste. He's extravagant, but not wasteful. Does that make sense? Every time he made food, loaves and fishes, it's always too much. But they always picked it up because he doesn't waste, but he is extravagant. How much sky do we need? He's not wasteful, but he's extravagant. So if everything belongs to the Father who passes it on to the Son, who now inherits everything as our elder brother, then he is positioned to pass it on to you and to me. Which means he has given us legal access to everything that is necessary for us to complete our impossible assignment. Mission impossible. Made possible. All right. We're getting down to the end, I promise. Jump to verse 14. The natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them. 
because they are spiritually discerned. Here's the point that I started with that I'll try to wrap this up with is that oftentimes when I've, you know, I've prayed, I've needed an answer and I, I work so hard. I, I try to calm myself down. I try to praise and quote verse. I try to do any one of a thousand different Christian activities so that I can hear God's voice. And all I do is get more stressed and more anxious and more, God, do you realize what time it is? I mean, it's like five minutes till D-Day and I got to have an answer. And, and, and just that anxiousness actually works against the voice of the Lord. And here's what happens. He says the natural man cannot perceive the things of the Spirit of God. They must be spiritually discerned. The natural man doesn't hear. The spirit man does. So what happens? It's like AM and FM radio. God's on AM. I've got it on FM. I can go from one end of that dial to the other. I'm not going to pick up his voice, even though he's talking. Right now, there are signals. There are baseball game, or football games going through. There's all kinds of uh, events, music, movies. All these things are in the room right now, passing right through. The signals are here. You just have to have the right receiver to pick up the signal. The voice of the Lord is constant towards us because he has so much to say. But it is only received by a, the spirit man. And so when I try to train my natural man to pick up the things of the Spirit of God, I only get more stressed. I only get more frustrated because I just can't hear. And that's where the deception comes. Well, it's just hard to hear God's voice. Faith is just this far off thing that occasionally I touch, but boy, it's so difficult or it's so hard to hear his voice. Eric's not here this morning, but most of you know he has, he still has not yet been healed. Um, of his uh, deafness. He's got 85 to 90 percent deafness, and he's the senior leader of this house. God's put a grace on him to function beautifully. But when he was growing up with loss of hearing, I never, I never blamed him for a lack of hearing. I always spoke loud enough. It's my responsibility as a father to be heard. If I can do that as an earthly father, certainly he can. There are no excuses for how well you and I hear. It's not the ability to hear that we depend on. It's his ability to speak. But if I have it on FM and he's talking on AM, you can take it from one end of the dial. You can claim. You can claim it. You can confess every verse on hearing. You can bind and loose. You can rebuke every demon you can think of. You're still not going to get an FM station on an AM dial. And no matter what you do, you will never tame your flesh enough to perceive the voice of God. It is only spiritually discerned. So here's the challenge. The challenge then is you hear from God beautifully. Just say it with me. I hear from God. It's a beautiful thing. I love his voice. Do you remember the two guys in the road to Emmaus? I, this may be one of my favorite stories in the Bible. They're talking along. They don't know it's Jesus. They're asking questions. And after he's taken up, they turn to each other and they said, did not our hearts burn while he was speaking to us? That's the voice. The voice ignites burning hearts. The voice, it's different than every other voice. It's the reason Peter could say, all right, if it's you, bid me to come. Because I know there'll be a fire in my soul when I hear that word, and I'll come. There's something about the voice. It is, it is the, the flip side of that coin. If we cried to the Lord, he heard us. The other side of that coin is, is that you were designed to hear God's voice. And the distinguishing mark of the New Testament church has always been that his people hear his voice. Jesus said it, my sheep know my voice. My sheep, it is natural for them to hear my voice. It is normal. It's been written into their DNA. It is their nature to hear my voice. Tragically, in church history, how many know when you react to error, you usually create another error? And there was a reaction to uh, mistakes that were made in church history that decisions could be made by spiritual leaders that would be contrary to Scripture. And they, would actually, they actually took the liberty to set new doctrine and new truth, things that were not in the Word. And it was very deliberate and outwardly. And so in Luther's day, there was such a reaction to this, to this, this thing that if, they claim to hear from God, and yet they're creating things that are opposite of Scripture, that if that's true, then we have to protect ourselves from that error. And so what they did is they basically trimmed it down to say you can't hear from God. 
the voice of God can't be for us now. There cannot be that super act- act- activity now because we have Scripture. And in the, a good motive to protect the validity of Scripture, they overstep their bounds and cut off the capacity of the peer, people of God to naturally hear the voice of God. It's not about creating new Scripture. It's about an ongoing relationship in which power is brought into a person's life to bring display of, of the kingdom of God on earth. It's about hearing the voice of the Lord. It's about having burning hearts, about being a people that just hear from the Lord and suddenly something is possible that wasn't possible a minute earlier. It's because he spoke. We live by the breath of God. We live by his voice. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. It is our nature. You reduce the Christian life down. All of us are, are, we started by hearing the voice of the Lord, crying out to him, he saved us. You boil the Christian life down, it's the fact that everybody has heard. It's the only way you could cry out. Everyone hears. It's in the nature of humanity to hear the voice of the Lord. And his voice is the only one that can pierce to the heart. And so in efforts to protect Scripture, they denied that God would speak to people today. And yet the reaction to an error created another error and caused people to live out of just a simple intellectual approach to reading the Bible. I'll I tell you what happens to me. I, I, I love the Word so much, and this is what happens. I read until he talks. More has happened in my life through two things. Worship, recognizing the presence, and, and taking advantage of the privilege he's given us to minister to him. He's not, you know, he's not an egotist in need of our affirmation. He's, he knows that the most important thing for us is to become like him. There's nothing greater. And he knows that we always become like whatever we worship. So he brings us into this environment where we get to minister to him because it's the best thing for us. It keeps all the priorities straight. And then in the reading of the word to read and then he speaks. You know, you may come and say, well, what does it mean? I go, I'm clueless. Well, why are you so happy about the verse? Well, because my my heart jumped inside when I read it. Does that make sense to you? Something got activated. All I know is there's a gold mine here and I'm standing at the face of the cave. I can't point to the gold gem, you know, to the gold nuggets yet, but I know it's there because my heart leapt. Something happened inside of me that says, this is where I get to camp for a while because God's talking. He sends out this invitation. He says, son, said, this is home. I have scriptures in this, in, in here that through these last 40 years, I have verses in there as probably most of you do. I have verses in there that feel like they were written just for me. I mean, if, I, I almost feel offended when I hear somebody teach on it. Like, you didn't ask for permission. That's mine. That's my verse. I can take you to the location. I can take you to the day. I, you know, I can take you to the moment God spoke that to me. That's my verse. What are you doing? And then I realized, oh, yeah, there's more than one child in this family. <laughs> My desire for you is that as worshipers, as those, let me mention three realms, worshipers, recognizing presence, people of the word, in the word we read and read because the reading gives us the capacity to hear. And then the voice comes on that verse or that chapter or that theme. And one more area, it's when we put ourselves in over our head in ministry. Where if God doesn't show up, we will fail. Those realms have taught me more about the voice of the Lord. I've learned that if I strive to hear, I only, I'm just twisting that dial all from one end of the FM to the other, and I'm binding and loosing, and I'm blowing the shofar, I'm waving flags, I'm anointing myself with oil, I'm doing everything. I'm pulling out all the Christian toys I can find. (laughs) Nothing's helping me to hear from God. Until you realize, I have a spirit man that has been hearing all the time. Brian wrote a song some years ago, 
uh, such a great phrase out of Song of Solomon, though I sleep, yet my heart is awake. Everything in the natural is shut down because I'm tired, but my spirit man is in full communion with the Holy Spirit, and he's fully awake. So learning to draw from that that God has made you to be brings the voice ever present. Let's stand. Yeah, yeah. We're going to pray over this and, and then uh, go into ministry time and let you guys go. Paul is preaching tonight. It's going to be outrageous as always. That'll be a lot of fun, so I encourage you to show up for that one. Here's what I would love to see the Lord do for us. To help us become aware of our spirit man. Wigglesworth would say of himself, he was, he was not a large man uh, in stature. He would say, my natural man is small, but my spirit man is a giant. It's amazing. You can be bigger on the inside than you are on the outside. That almost sounds like C.S. Lewis or something. That sounds like from the Space Trilogy or something. But you can be bigger on the inside than you are on the outside. My prayer for you, in fact, I pray it now, is that, Lord, you'd help us to become aware of the difference of the spirit man, that which you designed to stand face to face, fully suited to stand before you in communion, in the exchange of life, our joys to minister to you, and we are alive because you minister to us. I pray that you would heighten the awareness of every person in this room to become aware of the voice of the Lord. We love your word. We ask you to speak to us in the word. Speak to us when we're in over our head in places to serve where you just bring what's impossible to the forefront. And in worship, you continuously heighten our awareness of all that is right, all that is good. We just give you thanks for that. Well, you know you've had a good day when somebody came to me in communion and said, who do I need to talk to to get saved? That's that's a good day right there. The fish start jumping in the boat. I like it. So, Mary, wherever you are, God bless you. Welcome welcome to the kingdom and others who came forward today. Paul, why don't you come on up with me?